Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. With his health failing, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. He found a haven in a working class district of the city known as Little Russia. There Isaac took on a new name, Ishmael. Within hours of his arrival, he was embroiled in the affairs of a brutal member of the Mediza organized crime family known as Leo. Convinced by a longtime friend, Frankie, to flee from his commitments to the Mediza family, Isaac found himself hunted by the ruthless Leo. On a rooftop, far from witnesses, Leo murdered Frankie. Only through the use of his skills as a hacker was Isaac able to drive Leo off. Now wounded, alone, and far from help, Isaac depends on the kindness of strangers. What do you do when the only way to save those you love is through the use of proxies? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Proxy by Colby Tracks. Thirty. I woke to the side of Fatima's burqa, blocking my view of the room. I heard Farhan's voice from somewhere behind Fatima. Enough stalling. We need him ready to work now. We can't move him now, Fatima said as he turned to the table. That is what you've been saying every day since we brought him here. Farhan pulled a chair up before me. His eyes seemed to be crawling along something to the side of my face. What's wrong with him this time? Fatima turned from his gear on the table. The power cells for his shunt network failed yesterday at about three in the afternoon. One of your men found him comatose at supper time. They sent for me. I did what I could. Ferran's hand moved past my ear and tugged at something. This is the best you can do? Why didn't you just replace the power cells? When I arrived, his vital signs were faint. The first priority was to determine the cause of injury and remedy that, Fatima answered. I thought I heard a tone of irritation in his voice. So you plugged him into the wall, Ferran asked, definitely angry. Did you determine what caused the failure? Yes, I plugged him into the wall, as you put it. I couldn't tell if Fatima's irritation was from me or Ferran. As far as the cause of the failure of the power cells, that lies firmly in his hands. His computer was still active when I arrived, and it appears he had hacked into his shunt network and overrode the settings I had set when they were installed. Ferran cocked his head. I thought I saw him smile. A thin smile. The same smile I had seen on Leo's face when he realized I wasn't returning to BTS. Why would he do such a thing? The words had the feeling of a rhetorical question. Based on the logs I have recovered from the shunt network, the hemorrhaging is worse than my scans anticipated, as any form of excitement would increase his blood pressure, and his blood pressure affected his aphasia. I can only surmise that he did it in order to work longer and harder than recommended, Fatima answered. He is stable now. But in my opinion, an operation to replace the power cells would result in additional hemorrhaging if performed in situ. Without a fully equipped operating theater and surgical team, it would be preferable to simply shut off the shunts and let him pass on to his maker, there to be judged for his actions. Ferran shook his head. No, no, couldn't have that. What time did you say the shunts failed? Fatima hesitated for a moment before answering. According to the logs, his shunt network failed at 1503 City Standard Time. Ferran chuckled. Nice, very nice. He stood over me, a broad smile on his face. Boy, I know what you did. You tweaked those shunts in order to orchestrate the police assault on the nesting doll. Too bad you failed. I see you understand me. You should see your eyes. So big, so scared. I struggled to speak. The words wouldn't form. Fatima pushed past Ferran. Stop it. You're spiking his vital signs. Ferran stepped back across the room. The police never found Nona. What they did find were two wounded men in the third basement before the underroad access tunnel. I see a smile now. You know something, don't you? I'd been such an idiot. The elevator went to the third basement 
because that was where the underroad access was. In the core, places like Park Terrace and Crystal Towers, the city had bored an immense network through the bedrock. These tunnels mirrored the streets above, allowing deliveries to be made without clogging the streets with delivery vans. I knew the underroad system was always expanding. I never thought they made it out this far. I had seen delivery vehicles on the streets around Little Russia, so maybe the network was in the process of being installed. But the penthouse elevator had been on the plans. How long ago had they been updated? Why would the nesting doll link to the underroad, but not a place like Georgie's Market? I needed to research this thing. I tried to lift my hand. It felt like lead. Ferran saw my movement. He turned to Fatima and said, He knows what's happening. He'll be fine. Get him ready to move. We have the maker ready for him. When did you hope to move him? Fatima asked. From the set of his shoulders, I knew he wasn't happy with the orders from Ferran. This afternoon, Ferran said. I can have a team here by... He pulled out a cheap VoIP phone and checked the time. It's half past nine now. I want him ready to move by one. Fatima's hands fell to his side. I saw him tighten his hands into fists. He can't be moved today. Why not? All we need is a portable power supply to plug him in and a box to put him into. And we could take him anywhere. Ferran snapped. Fatima spoke slowly and carefully. If you move him today, before I am sure his vitals are stable, you will kill him. I thought you said you stabilized him. Is he not stable now? He has been stable for only a few hours, and that was while he was stationary. Moving him will cause him issues. Just imagine being moved in a box. Your life depended on a power cord not coming unplugged. Every jostle, stumble, or stare would cause you anxiety. That anxiety would increase your blood pressure. With an increase in blood pressure, the hemorrhaging will increase possibly beyond the ability of the shunts to keep up. Fatima spoke slowly, choosing his words carefully. Then tranquilize him. He's not awake. He can't get anxious, Ferran retorted. That was my plan, Fatima answered. But I need to know how stable he is. If I misjudge his dose, I could easily kill him with a tranquilizer as by moving him without sedation. So, in your opinion, we need to wait. Ferran grated at having to bow to Fatima's medical authority. If you want him alive to perform the job, yes, you have to wait. Fatima stood with his shoulders taunt, his fists balled at his side. The falsetto he affected, gone, replaced with a deepness he'd never used around me. Ferran appeared deflated as he spoke. How long before you think we can move him? Fatima held his pose. Seventy-two hours at the most. I'll let you know if he is ready before then. Seventy-two hours. We've waited this long. What difference will three days make? Ferran said. I saw him pick up my Opemapo null and fiddle with the back. He pulled out the fuel reservoir and poured it on the floor. The medicine smell of Everclear filled the room. He put the reservoir back and picked up the nearly empty bottle of Everclear. He can't make himself worse if he can't excite himself. He examined the bottle of clear alcohol closely. He shook his head. Looks like you've been a busy boy. Well, no more of that. Relax, recover, and be ready to work when we move you. Ferran pointed at Fatima with the bottle. He better be ready to move in 72 hours. No excuses this time, or you'll pay. Don't pretend you don't understand. Ferran turned and left Fatima and I alone in my cell, the heavy door slamming like a prison door. Fatima waited silently until only the sound of the pumps and fans of the Amazov catfish farm remained to mark our place in the world. His shoulders slumped. His grip relaxed. His voice returned to his normal falsetto. He took a small bottle from his bag and removed the fuel reservoir from the Pemapo Null for the second time in ten minutes. Rubbing alcohol. Don't worry, it will work. The same fuel cells are used in most artificial organs. Lungs, liver, pancreas, hearts, eyes. They all run on either ethyl or methyl alcohol. 
Fatima pulled my table closer to my bedside. The legs vibrated loudly under the weight of the ancient high-definition television set. Your things are within reach. Do what you have to do. I will do what I must. I must have given Fatima a questioning look, or he was just ready to talk. He sat on the chair and spoke softly. Faran has held my lifestyle against me. It is strange that a man dedicated to the Abedini sect would blackmail another over his way of life. Very strange that an Abedini, who believes in the perfection of the body Allah gave him, would be so scared of others finding out his true form. Very strange. I wanted to answer, but the words refused to form. You have done a great thing. I don't think anyone but me knows how far you went to save her. You've given me the strength I need to take my final step along the Abedini path. It will test my family's faith, but belief without testing is meaningless ritual. Fatima turned his body, his head inclined toward the ceiling. He stood up and headed for the door. Be careful. Relax before you continue your struggle. He stood in the door a long time. He turned one last time and said, I didn't change the shunt network passwords. Your fate is in your hands. He left me alone with the rattle of pipes, the drone of fans, and the whine of pumps. To this day, I still can't figure out what made Fatima do what he was about to do. Firmware Proxy is the second book in the Firmware Pentology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins moments after Firmware Hijacked ends. So if you haven't heard or read Firmware Hijacked, this would be a good time to head on over to ColbyJack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 20 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware Hijack and Proxy are both available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, amazon.com, and Barnes and Noble. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both Firmware Hijack and Proxy is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, we would like to support our work, drop on by ColbyJack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located in the right-hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the button will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Proxy is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike, 3.0 license. Do what you want with it, just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast, while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. If you want to get social with me, I do mostly Twitter. So if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. Spelled the same as above, C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. We could sing that all night long. Thank you once again, and have a wonderful week.